tutorial, we're going to learn to make the scarf on the mannequin behind me. It's called Delicate Brambles. And if you are an experienced lace knitter, this will be no problem for you. I'll walk you through the trickier parts. But I've also designed this to be a good first lace project for someone who's never knit lace before. I'd say if you are an advanced beginner knitter, someone who's comfortable with the basics, this is a good first project in working with lace yarn and working lace stitches. And that's for a few reasons. First, this project only uses 50 grams of yarn, so it's pretty quick. And it is, um, so it's a small project. And the stitch count in the lace never changes. If you're looking at knitting um, one of the big triangular shawls that, uh, with the charts and everything else, this is a good first project for moving on to projects like that because it will get you familiar with using the lace weight yarn. If you want to get your copy of this pattern to follow along, uh, the link to my website is in the video description field below and I'll give you a link here on screen as well. Now the yarn that I use in this project is called Colleton Lace and it's from Louette and it's 100% kid mohair. And I learned a lot about mohair when I was putting this project together because I had only used mohair yarn once before and I didn't enjoy it and I kind of wrote mohair off as a fiber I didn't want to use. But there is, there are miles of difference between low quality mohair and high quality mohair and I've learned that with this project. Um, first thing about mohair is mohair comes from Angora goats. So get your mind around that. <laughs> mohair comes from Angora goats. And a lot of the quality of the mohair has a lot to do with the, the age of the goat. This is kid mohair, meaning that it comes from, this yarn is made from the haircut of a yearling goat, which is still very soft. And the older the mohair, uh, the older the Angora goat gets, the rougher and coarser their hair becomes. But this is really soft. This is very soft. In fact, it feels, I would say it feels like cashmere against the skin, which is, good because I've made a scarf out of it. And not only is it soft, but it's also strong and it has some substance to it. So even though you're working with a really fine yarn, you don't have to worry about the yarn falling apart on you or snapping. And um, the substance of the yarn actually gives you really good stitch definition to because you're working on you know, these lace stitches that are kind of complicated stitches. You really want them to show up in the finished item. And um, the reason that we love to use mohair, I almost forgot what I was going to say. The reason that we love to use mohair is because of the, the halo that you get with the finished item. And you know, mohair fuzzes out a little bit and gives you this beautiful halo. And the twist of this yarn keeps it from becoming a, you know, a, 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 a really fuzzy look. It just has this soft fuzz to it that still shows stitch definition, which is really important. Um, I guess what I can say is I'm really pleased with this yarn and I've changed my mind about mohair. This yarn also has, well the manufacturer says this yarn has minimal shedding. I'm going to say it has very minimal shedding. The mohair that I used in the past when I was knitting and when I was wearing the finished sweater, I was kind of in a cloud of mohair fuzz all the time. This yarn didn't do that. The only time I experienced any shedding was when I was winding it from the hank into the ball and I was pinching the yarn with my fingers to, to keep tension. And I had some mohair on my fingers when I was done winding it, but while I was knitting with it and while I've worn the scarf, there hasn't been any shedding. So I'm really pleased with this yarn. Um, again, information on getting your copy of the pattern and your yarn are in the video description field below on YouTube, and I'll give you another li link here on screen. And um, in the next segment, uh, we're going to talk about the construction of this scarf, and I'll give you a close-up look at the lace. Before we start in with the little scarf, I want to talk about needles because um, a lot of needle manufacturers have a line of needles that they call lace needles. And there's a reason for that because lace needles work really well for lace knitting. Lace needles have um, typically a long taper and a sharp point on them. And the long taper allows you to work the complicated stitches on the narrower part of the needle, which does make it easier. Blunt needles, um, 
they're, they're going to be more difficult, definitely, when you're working with lace stitches and lace weight yarn. But I, for my scarves, I used uh, Knitter's Pride Platina needles. I found them to work really well. And uh, in the video description field below and on my website, I'll give you some uh, links or I'll list out some other lace needle manufacturers that I've used and I've found to be good. And of course, you can always contribute in the comments if you know of another lace needle that's good that works well with lace weight yarn and complicated stitches. Um, like I promised, let's go ahead and take a close up look at the lace pattern. I've put this on white paper so you can see exactly how this looks. This has been not wet blocked, but just steamed out a little bit. And this also shows you the, the, the yarn. This is hand painted. This Colinton yarn is hand painted. And so you see a slight color variation as you go through the knitted piece. I think you'll be able to see it more in this finished, in this finished scarf. The color changes a little bit and it's really very pretty. Now I want to talk a little bit about how this goes together because we have, uh, this scarf is knit in two halves, two identical halves that are seamed together with Kitchener stitch at, or grafted together rather, at the back of the neck. And the reason that we do that is so that we have two matching cast on rows at the bottom of the scarf because cast on and bind off rows are never perfectly identical. So we have two matching cast on rows at the bottom of the scarf and the lace points the same direction on both, both sides instead of one being kind of upside down from the other one. And this is uh, knit as you see it and then once you're finished you go back and knit uh, an opposite side of this pocket here and then to wear it one end of the scarf goes through the pocket on the other side you straighten it out, and that's how it's worn. And it stays on your neck, won't fall off because of that little pocket. Okay, so we start at the bottom of, of one of the sides, and as I said, it's knit identically. And the lace pattern, of course, is written out row by row in the pattern. And I'm going to show you how to work the stitches in the lace pattern and talk about some good practices for lace knitting in general. And as always, I have my, um, I have my demonstration here on much thicker yarn and much thicker needles so that you can see what I'm doing. We're going to go through the stitches here. You have a little setup work to do. You can use any cast on, any sturdy cast on, like a long tail cast on or a knitted cast on. I've used long tail and I'm on a wrong side row here. All right side rows are just plain knitting and then all wrong side rows use the same stitches. So I'm going to show you how to use the stitches and I highly encourage you to use a row counter to keep track of what row you're on as you knit the rows. Let me find my tail end. I should show you this yarn. Um, this is the lace yarn. This has already been wound and you can see how fine this is. And there is, uh, it's very smooth right now. There is not much of a halo on it. And the little bit of blooming that it does happens as it runs through your fingers. I just thought of that because the yarn I'm using for demonstration is much thicker than the actual yarn for the scarf. I think lace knitting is so fun because you're doing what you already know how to do, which is normal knit and purl stitches, but you're ending up with a fabric that's just so fine and delicate when you're finished or as you're working on it. So I'm on a wrong side row here and I'm going to start working the bramble stitch. And the stitch count stays the same the whole time with every row of the lace pattern, but you're going to increase by two stitches and decrease by two stitches across the row. So this first stitch I'm going to do is knit front, back, front. So instead of just knitting a stitch normally like this, I'm going to knit three stitches into this one stitch and this is what it looks like. I'm going to knit a stitch normally, but I leave that old stitch on the left needle, swing the tip of my needle around to the back of the stitch, and at this point it's a KFB, knit front, back. Pull that through, but leave the stitch on the old needle leave the old stitch on the needle and knit into the front of the stitch again. Pull that through and then pull it off once you have three stitches. I'm going to show you this again across the row. Then the next stitch is purl three together. 
So we yarn forward to work a purl and you put your needle in through three stitches. Purl two together is a pretty common stitch, but purling three together is a pretty major decrease. Wrap it and pull it through. So I increased by two in the first stitch and I decreased by two in the following stitch. Now we go back to the uh, knit front back front again. A normal knit stitch, swing the tip of your needle around to the back of the stitch, and work a normal knit stitch again into the front of the stitch. And I'll show you this some more. Then I yarn forward to work a purl three together. One, two, three. And then yarn back to work the knit front back front again. Knit front, knit back, knit front, and off the left needle. Yarn forward, purl three together, front, back, front, yarn forward, purl three together, yarn back, knit front, Swing the tip of your needle around to the back loop of the stitch, knit back, and knit into the front loop again. Yarn forward, purl three together. Now your stitch count will be exactly the same as when you started, and a good way to know that you're on track is that your stitch count's exactly the same as when you started. Now that said, uh, I have you use, or I call for, circular needles for this project, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Well, there are, there's one reason for that, and, and the main reason for it is lifelines. You're going to continue working the lace pattern as it's listed out row by row in the pattern, and you'll end up with a, a piece of fabric like this. And I know that... Um, I've talked about lifelines before. We actually need to use lifelines in this pattern um, to mark some rows. But if at any point you want to save the stitches as they are in case you make a mistake so you can rip back to this row where all the stitches are held safely on scrap yarn, lifelines are pretty great. I'm going to show you why I'm having you use circular needles for this and how to string a lifeline and how awesome they are. So, you want to use uh, some yarn in a contrasting color. This is really fine yarn. I know a lot of people when they're working with lace weight yarn, they like to use dental floss. That works well. Um, as long as it's a different color than what, what the actual yarn is in your project. And you can string a lifeline at any point. I have um, some students here locally who like to string a lifeline every couple of inches. Just in case they make a mistake, they can pull out their needle and, and uh, rip back to that lifeline where all the stitches are held safely and then just continue from there. And uh, we're going to string a lifeline with the stitches on the cord. And the reason for that is that you have some more room for the needle and, and the scrap yarn with the stitches on the cord. It's a bit harder, especially with the lace, the lace weight yarn, to get your needle in through the stitches when it's actually on the needle. So slide it to the cord and then just pull your tapestry needle through every single stitch, being careful not to miss one. When I have string lifelines, I actually like to count the stitches. I like counting though. So I count the stitches to make sure that I'm not missing any. You want to do it in good light so you can see what you're doing. And then that is done. I know there are people who uh, will put uh, maybe the dental floss or whatever yarn they're using through the hole and in the interchangeable needles and knit through that way. I've never actually done that. I like to do it this way. Anyway, so I've strung this lifeline, and you can string these lifelines anywhere in the work. People ask me, how often should I string a lifeline? And I say, how often can you bear to rip out back to a certain point? So <laughs> people who really don't want to have to rip out very much, maybe string them more often. It just takes a second. But we're going to string this lifeline before we start the little 
this little pocket area to mark that row. And that's really all there is to it for this. Um, you're going to do this and then you're going to switch to smaller needles and do a decrease row. And the way you switch to sw smaller needles is just put the smaller needle in your right hand and knit directly off the needle, the, the, the bigger needle, onto the smaller needle. And you use a smaller needle for the pocket. It doesn't need to be circular needles because you're not going to string a lifeline through the pocket. It's pretty simple. You can use DPNs if you like as long as there's a good sharp point on the end. Let me see. I think that's all the pieces I had for this section, really the most complicated part to get going is the, the, the lace pattern, but if you're using a row counter, that's easy. And then as long as you're stringing lifelines, that, that protects you from even if you make a terrible mistake, you have the lifeline in place and that will keep you from uh, having to rip out the whole thing. So these are good practices for, the lifelines at least, is a good practice for any time you're knitting lace. As actually, especially if you're going to be knitting a big triangular shawl with 300 stitches and um, charts and all of your concentration. Just stringing a lifeline through uh, allows you to rip back to a point that you can easily start up again from that point. Okay, in the next section, Yes, in the next section, we're going to talk about grafting together the two halves of the scarf. Once you finish the two halves of the scarf, it's time to graft those two halves together at the back of the neck. We're going to use Kitchener stitch to do that, and if you've used Kitchener stitch before, no different with lace weight yarn, but just in case you haven't, I'm going to show you how to do that. Let's take a look. So here's the scarf and here's the pocket and then at the back of the neck, it doesn't look like much on the right side of the work, but you can see that there is a little ridge, a lace ridge on the back of the work where the Kitchener stitch happened. Looks really good from the front of the work and it's not distracting or anything to the back of your neck. And it gives us the lace pattern facing the same direction. So here's my ultra bulky sample and I have my lifelines in place, you know, following the, destruction, the instructions in the pattern. My lifelines are there. I'm ready to seam the back of the neck. If you've been using an interchangeable circular set, the cords with stoppers on the end work really well for stitch holders. So when you're, after you finish knitting one, you can take the needles off and just pop these end caps on and you can take the needles on to do the next one. And so that's what I've done is I've just put the needles on um, uh, one on each half of the scarf so that I can work the Kitchener stitch. And to do the Kitchener stitch, you want the right side of the work facing out. So I'm going to put the two halves together like this, and the wrong side of the work, oops, let me pull this down, the wrong side of the work is here and here, the right side of the work is out. I'm going to slide this all to the ends of the needle, and the pattern tells you to leave one end long, longer than the other one. You have your tapestry needle. And you're going to do, you're going to uh, be grafting the two halves together and I have a little chant I like to use. <laughs> I've said it a lot in the videos before. The first two setup stitches are to put the needle as if to knit in the first, uh, I'm sorry, put the needle as if to purl in the first stitch and pull it through and then as if to knit in the back stitch and leave it on. So the way this is going to go is we're going to work the first stitch, the second stitch on the front needle, then the first stitch, the second stitch on the back needle, and then the whole thing is repeated again. So this is the chant. Go, not the chant, this is the process. Go in as if to knit on the front needle, take that stitch off, go in as if to purl on the next stitch, leave that stitch on. Go in as if to um, purl on the first stitch, pull that off. Go in as if to knit on the second stitch, pull that on and give the work a tug. So now I'll, <clears throat> now I'll give you the chant. It's knit, off, purl, then jump to the back needle, purl, off, knit. And give it a tug. Knit off, purl, purl, off, 
purl off knit knit off purl purl off knit and you just continue this across you can actually pull it pretty tight and then straighten it back out again that's what I do to make sure the tension's good you finish this all the way across until you have just one stitch on the front needle and one stitch on the back needle and you just knit off that one and purl off the the back needle and you're done and then you're ready to weave in the ends and be uh, be done with the grafting the last thing we have to do on the pattern is to Yes, finish the, finish the little pockets. so you can tuck one end of the scarf in the other, and we'll talk a little bit about washing and blocking. Once you get the two halves of the scarf grafted together, the last little bit of work we have to do is the back of the pocket to make it a pocket so that you can tuck one end of the scarf into the other. In the pattern, I tell you, you can choose to do, to finish the pocket on one side or both. I found that I like to have it done on both because that little bit of double thickness when one side's tucked into the other, I think it kind of gives it substance. It feels nice, but you, you don't have to. You don't have to do both sides. I'm going to show you how to do that right now. Let's take a look. Here we are with our bulky sample and our lifelines in place. And this is exactly why we strung the lifelines, so that we have a guideline for where to pick up stitches to finish the back of the pocket. Now this is the wrong side of the work, and on the back of the pocket, we're going, we're going to make the back of the pocket one stitch, two stitches narrower than the front of the pocket. And I'll show you how that looks. These stitches are so tiny, it's kind of hard to see. Here's the wrong side of the work, and the back of the pocket is just slightly narrower than the front. And it's, it's nice because you know it's going to look good from the front if it's slightly narrower on the back. So we're going to use this as a lifeline and pick up stitches and knit the back here. So this is what I'm going to do. <clears throat> this lifeline is, is a guide, and I'm going to be picking up stitches one row up from the lifeline. If you pick up two rows up or something, it's not a big deal. We're going to skip the first stitch because we're making this narrower than the front. You put your needle, oh I'm sorry I should explain that. We have knit, purl, knit. I'm going to pick up a purl bump between the two knit stitches as my first stitch. And I take my yarn and kind of flop it over and wrap the back needle with that and pull it through. And then continuing to use the guideline, I'm going to go under both legs of the next knit stitch and then go under the purl bump of the next purl stitch, both legs of the next knit stitch. And if you end up getting a little bit off track and losing your guideline a little bit, not a big deal. If you end up picking up one stitch too many or one stitch too few, not a big deal. This is the back of the pocket. It's not really going to show. And the stitches are so tiny in the lace that it won't show. So you'll work across like that, and then you'll knit this pocket. And then the top, the top lifeline here is in place to show you where to stitch it down. And you'll, you'll knit this and bind it off, and then just take your tapestry needle and, the, and the, the yarn you have left over from the bind off, and just whip stitch it down using the, uh, the lifeline as a guide just below the lifeline. And as long as the whip stitch is like nothing fancy, you just want to grab something, um, grab a little bit of yarn from the scarf and go through the pocket. And as long as you're not poking the needle all the way through the yarn and back up, you see that will show on the front. But just grabbing yarn in the back the same way you picked up stitches, you can just whip stitch it down. Let me look at my list here. The last thing we have to talk about is washing and blocking. Uh, this scarf, well, let me back up. When you're knitting a lot of lace, a lot of different lace patterns, the lace will be really scrunchy and not show up very much at all until you actually block it out and, and look at 
then see it in its full glory. This lace is a little bit bunched up and it'll, it will change a little bit with blocking, but you're not going to get that massive stretch. Um, this lace looks good as you're knitting it without blocking, but to block it, you'll want to um, put the finished scarf into a sink with a little bit of wool wash and have it just be just tepid water and let it soak squish the wool soap into everything and then let it soak in there for 15 minutes or a half hour and then take it out and gently squeeze the extra water out and roll it up in a towel and I usually in a dry towel a bath towel I usually put that on the floor and step all over it to squish out the extra water and then you set it out flat to dry and this is a long narrow piece if you don't have a blocking board you can just use an ironing board or really any place if you can pin into something, an ironing board is kind of ideal, or a blocking board, because you can pin into it. But if you just have a place where you can set it out, that's okay, too. And then, for best results, you want to square out the corners. Make sure it's the same width all the way down, narrowing at the pocket, and then expanding back out again. And square out the corners with pins, so that you end up with that really crisp look of the, the two cast-on ends. I think that's everything we need. We went through all of the different pieces of this scarf. I look forward to seeing how your scarf looks in all the different colors in this yarn. Good luck.